starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello everyone. My name is Dario Sambunyak, and I warmly welcome you to the first webinar in the Cochrane Learning Live series, organized by the Learning and Support Department of the Cochrane Central Executive. Um, before we start today's topic, uh, I'd like to invite you to use chat room for questions and comments. Uh, please use it at any time during the webinar and we will try to address your questions after specific question, uh, sections of the presentation. Uh, we are recording this webinar and will make it available to watch afterwards. Uh, following the webinar, we'll ask you to give us a feedback, not today, perhaps tomorrow. Um, um, and uh, we will also provide support during the next week, but more about that at the end of the webinar. So without further ado, let me introduce Annalise Arno, the Community Manager at Covidence, who will show us how to use Covidence software for streamlining production of systematic reviews. So Annalise, over to you. Great, thank you very much for the introduction, Dario, and thank you everybody for making the time to attend the webinar today. We really appreciate it. Uh, as Dario said, my name is Annalise Arno, and I'm the Community Manager for Covidence, and what that means is I do all of our user support as well as sort of connect our user community back to the development process and vice versa. So I'm looking to sort of always have an ongoing dialogue between those two groups. Uh, Let's see, I also do training sessions, so if, if anybody ever needs to get in contact and maybe wants to organize one for their group, group that's, that's also available. Uh, and for reference, my background is in public health, which you might notice will become apparent when you see some of my example reviews, but I try to come at everything with a, a researcher perspective rather than a tech perspective, and I find that sometimes helpful for our users to know. As far as goals for this session, we are not looking to have anybody walk away from this as an expert in Covidence at all. Really, our goal is that you feel comfortable enough to start using the software on your own and know where to go when you have questions or sort of be familiar enough with the interface to be able to figure things out. And Dario, would you mind just confirming again that you guys can see my Covidence screen now? Yes, yes, we can see it. Brilliant. Okay, so I'll switch over to that now and we'll do a sort of start to finish walkthrough of the tool. Uh, you can feel free to ask questions at any time, although it is often helpful for people to actually just wait until I'll pause after each segment of the tool and ask for questions because much of the time I, I tend to answer questions before they're even asked with going through each section. Okay, so this is your Covenants login page. This is what you'll see when you first go to covenants.org and click login. You can sign in either with a private or, you know, an institutional email and a password. You can sign in that way, or you can sign in with your Archie credentials. I'll sign in with my Archie credentials just so that you guys can see what that would look like. And here we are at my homepage. So this has a list of all of the active reviews that I have going right now, or my current reviews. You can also look at my archived reviews here. Archived reviews really are not inactive in any other way besides they're being taken off of your homepage. So all of the information is still there. You can still edit them. You can still screen on them. They're just not on your homepage. And I would recommend for especially people working in groups, uh, to archive reviews rather than to delete them. You'll see if I hover over here, I have two options. And deleting does delete it for all reviewers, so that's sometimes helpful to keep in mind. So we're going to be using a uh, review today called Webinar. And this is what we call our Covenance dashboard, or your review dashboard, rather. So you'd get one of these specific to each one of your reviews. It will automatically open up the section where most of your references are at that point in time. So you can see that I have over 6,000 in title and abstract screening, so that's what it opens up. I see this progress bar here. The dark green are references that have been moved forward, so that's 973. If we do out all the maths of how many are in irrelevant, full text, etc. it would come out to 973. Uh, there aren't any that are currently waiting on one vote. 
and I have 24 conflicts that need resolving and over 6,000 references to vote on. I'm actually going to switch this again to dual reviewer mode, which I'll, I'll go through. I just switched it this morning and forgot to switch it back. I know I'm rushing there, but I will go through it in more detail later. Okay, so going back to our dashboard, you get one of those progress bars for each stage of your review. Covenants is split into three main stages, the two screening stages, and then extraction. And you can see a progress bar for each of them. So the first thing you would typically do in any review would be to import some references. So we'll go through the import studies tool now. What I personally find really useful with this tool is you can actually skip references ahead if you have maybe done some screening outside of Covenants and you know, okay, I have this set of five or ten studies that I know already I want included. I don't want to have to go through the two screening stages. You can just put those right into included. And you can do the same for any of the other lists. So you have your two screening stages here, included studies, full text exclusions, and title and abstract exclusions or irrelevant. You would select a file from your computer, kept locally on your computer. Let's see, we'll do a nice small one. There's no limit to how many you can do at a time, but I would recommend keeping it under maybe three or 4,000 at a time. It might be helpful to break them down into chunks if you have much bigger than that. So I would then import that file, and it's going to go into screening and each of those references will be added. So we have four main file types that we take, a PubMed XML, a, an EndNote XML, a text file with CRS formatting, or a text file with RAS formatting. And you can, uh, files with an extension of RAS can be imported directly. So you see now that those have all been added to my screening list. I'm going to collapse all the abstracts so that you can see a few more of the references and get a feel for how this list looks. So you would get a list of all of your references here, and we're now into title and abstract screening. We have three options of voting at this stage. Uh, we get a lot of questions about the maybe versus yes vote, and I'll say that at this point, maybes and yes essentially function the same. What they're really useful for is that if that reference then comes back as a conflict, it can be helpful to know that one of the reviewers was in fact uncertain. And it can also just help you get through references a little bit quicker if you have that halfway option. As you vote, it'll be sort of slide, it'll slide across and be taken off of your list. And the idea with Covenants is that all of the reviewers are actually working off of this same list. So as soon as something gets two votes, it'll be taken off of everybody's list. So you'll never run into a situation, or you shouldn't ever run into a situation where you end up with three votes or you know duplication of efforts. Because I am in dual reviewer mode, each of the ones that I just voted on are now going to go to my awaiting other reviewer screen. So you can see I have seven references here. My previous vote is highlighted in dark blue and I can change that if I want. Some helpful things to know in screening are highlights. Highlights uh, are programs and settings, which I'll go later, and you can have sort of keywords for inclusion or for exclusion. Inclusion keywords will go in green, and exclusion keywords will go in red, and you can see that they really pop out quite distinctly there. So as you're scrolling down, you would see them quite easily. And it does search both your titles and your abstracts. You can also program in your inclusion and exclusion criteria for reference. And again, as I scroll down, those will stay at the top. So it's sort of a little cheat sheet for your reviewers that if they ever forget, oh, is this meant to be in or out, it's really just for reference. We have a tagging function, which I find especially helpful because you can then filter by tag. So I'm going to select a completely random group of a few references here. And I'm going to tag them from this list. Now I've programmed these in, but these are customizable, so you can add whichever ones you choose. Uh, I like the come back to this tag because it's, I think, one of the most useful features of the tagging function is that 
if you want to read further about it or you know that you want to include that in your discussion but not necessarily your review, uh, you might use a tag like that. So now each of those references has a tag. If I click filter and then select come back to this from that list and click filter, it'll say, oh, we found four studies that had that tag and you would only see studies with that tag and then maybe vote on them right from there. Okay, so any questions on screening? Okay, it looks like no questions on screening so far. If one comes to you later, feel free to put it in the uh, questions box. So you heard me mention a few things about single reviewer mode versus dual reviewer mode and the keyword highlighting. So those are all adjusted from settings. I'm going to go through these pages right to left, actually. So if I go into settings and then criteria and exclusion reasons, you can see here those reasons that were in my so-called cheat sheet. You can add to those and delete from them at any time. And these are accessible for all of your co-authors to see. So this would be the same settings review-wide. Uh, you can edit your reasons for exclusion at the full text level. You can do that from here or you can do it from your full text review. And then down here at the bottom, I know it says keywords for full text, but it's actually keywords for screening in general. And so here are where you program in those inclusion and exclusion keywords. And again, you can delete to or add uh, these at any time. We'll go through team settings now. So this is a, a pretty important page because we get a lot of questions about assigning of references. And Covenants doesn't actually support the assigning of a specific subset of references. But what you can do is tell people to aim for a specific number of votes that they should be contributing. And they can keep track of that from this page. So you can see that Annie Arno, which is my personal account as opposed to my Archie account, has contributed 84 votes, whereas my Archie account has contributed 48, and so on. There's also rules that you can set here. You can say that a study has to be screened by one specific person or a group of people if you need you know, a minimum of one vote on each reference to be contributed by, say, a senior reviewer. You can indicate that there, as well as indicate who is authorized to solve any conflicts. Those rules are set separately for title and abstract screening, full text screening, and extraction. And of course, you have those same progress bars for each of those stages as well. Under add and remove reviewers, you can delete people from your review at any time. Uh, their work won't be undone. They will simply lose access to the review. Or you can invite a new reviewer there. And last but not least is review settings. So the most important thing on this page to know is this difference between dual screening, uh, dual reviewer screening, and single reviewer screening. So right now both of these are set to two. So that would be what we'd call dual screener mode or dual reviewer mode. Uh, and that means that each reference needs two votes in order to be moved forward, uh, whether that's to be excluded or moved on to the next stage. Now, if I change this to single reviewer, I like to go through this with people so that they can see that a pop-up is going to come up that says, hey, there are nine citations that already have one vote. If you switch to single reviewer, we're going to move those forward. And that's, that's actually permanent. So you can move those references back, but you can only move them back one by one. There's no review-wide way to say undo uh, the action of switching to single reviewer. Okay, so those are the settings, and I see that I have some questions here, so I'm going to go through them now. Uh, we have a question, what if I don't want studies to be removed when two no's are selected? 
I'm not sure if in this case you're going for if you actually want three people to be voting on each reference. If that is the case, then unfortunately Covenants doesn't support that. We only support single or dual reviewer at the minute. Uh, the studies themselves aren't actually removed from your review. They are simply moved into a different list. So they might be in your irrelevant list or uh, if you're at the full sex stage in your excluded list. You can always move them back and vote on them again. And somebody else wanted us to, I guess, go through the uh, reviewer contribution again. Okay, so that was under team settings. What these numbers indicate is how many references each of these people has voted on, or really how many votes they've contributed to the review overall. So unfortunately, there's no way to see which 84 those are, but we would see that Annie Arno has voted on 84 references. Annalise has voted on 48. Agustin has voted on 17. And Damian has voted on 11. I was referring to this as my Archie account because uh, the account I have with Covenants that's associated with my Archie account has my full name, Annalise, as opposed to the other one, which is Annie. There's one last question there about extraction, and I will cover that when we get to the extraction phase here. And there's one more question about importing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can I import abstracts from PubMed? So you can. Uh, we support import of PubMed XMLs, or if you've put them through a reference manager, they could be exported as an EndNote formatted XML or as an RIS file. RIS file. Okay, so there's a question here, I guess, about import and about deduplication. So when you import a file, it is automatically deduplicated. Uh, you can go through that from the Manage Imports page here. If I scroll down. We'll see, here was an import that had two duplicates in it. So I can check these duplicates, and it will show you a side-by-side -side reference of the one you already had versus the one that was trying to be imported. That deduplicates both within the file being imported as well as against any previous imports you have. So if you have something duplicated in several files or several database exports, it would be deduplicated. However, uh, Due to slight differences between some databases, this deduplication isn't absolutely perfect. So it might miss some. Okay, there's one last question here. What if authors have a conflict, i.e. it's their own study? Uh, can Covenant support making sure that other authors have selected the study? That's a very interesting situation, and actually, surprisingly enough, the first time I've heard of that. Uh, what I would do in that case is, there's no automatic way to do that, really. You would really have to, outside of Covenants, instruct the author with the conflict not to be voting on that reference. Okay, so we'll go through full text screening now, which should be relatively quick because it's pretty similar to title and abstract screening with, I would say, three main differences that I'm going to draw your attention to. The first is that instead of three voting options, we now have two. Make this a little bigger. So we now have two, include or exclude. When you vote to exclude, you do have to indicate a reason. You can only indicate one reason, and the authors do have to agree. So if two authors vote on the same reference and pick a different reason for exclusion, uh, that will come up as a conflict, and they need to indicate a final reason. This list of exclusion reasons is customizable, so if I click Edit this list, I can add to or delete from this. 
Covenants comes with a sort of pre-programmed standard set of exclusion reasons, uh, but you can delete from that at any time. Another pretty important difference is that you can, of course, add full text. So if I click View Full Text, you're going to see a file that I uploaded earlier to this reference. So depending on your browser's or your computer's default settings, this will either open in a new tab when I click on it or it'll download and open. On my computer, it will download and open. And you now see that PDF. You can actually add multiple PDFs. So for demonstration purposes, I'll add a second one to this same reference. I'm just going to pick a totally random PDF for the sake of demonstration. You'll see now it's added and I click finished. So now I have both of those PDFs attached to this one reference. And that's useful to know that if you accidentally upload the wrong one, uh, you would simply add the second one, uh, set the new one as primary and then remove the old one. Uh, we have a question here that quite often we might have multiple reasons to exclude a study. How do you handle this if you can only pick one reason for exclusion? So what I would do in that case is to use the add a note function and to type in, you know, your additional exclusion uh, reasons there. Now, of course, ideally in a Cochrane protocol, you should have a hierarchy of reasons. So you would indicate which one trumps another. Those PDFs are available to all of your co-reviewers uh, or co-review authors. Um, so it's the same as downloading a file, really. That file is now yours. It's kept locally on your computer uh, if you download it from Covidence. The same function for highlighting is available in full text review. So I'll scroll down and there we have a highlight, an exclusion highlight. If I keep scrolling, I should be able to find an inclusion highlight fairly quickly. Unfortunately, there aren't any. Hmm, it's interesting. But that would show up in green on this list as well. So to attach a PDF, I'll go through that again, you would click the Add Full Text button, select a file from your computer, that'll upload, and then click Finished. And now that PDF is attached and available for all of the people who have access to this review would all have access to this file. Uh, the highlights search the title and abstract, but they don't search the PDF. And there are no limits to the number of PDFs you can have. I mean, there, there might be some practical limits as far as uh, how many you might have open on one time, but that would really just be a matter of your internet connection. Uh, so there's a question here about when screening, can you see the MeSH or mTree subject headings? I'm not an information specialist, but I, th I think what you're referring to, unfortunately, is not available. So this is, this is pretty rigid as far as what you would see when you're screening. You see the authors, the title, the journal, and the year, and some volume information. These numbers at the side are covenants assigned numbers that indicate sort of in the approximate order that they were imported. And if there's a ref ID on a reference, you would also see that. Unfortunately, none of these have a ref ID. As well as you would see the abstract. Okay. Any other questions on full text screening? Uh, 
Uh, so there's a question about, essentially, I think what you're getting at is bulk PDF upload. And we do have a bulk PDF upload feature coming quite soon. Uh, we're sort of running final tests on it. If anyone wants to contact me, really, I can activate it on your account now if you're okay with knowing that the design of it might uh, might change a little bit in the future, really just the look. Uh, so that will enable you to upload multiple PDFs at once. There is a specific process that you have to go through to ensure that they are matched properly. Uh, and I won't get into that because it would take a little while to explain, but I'll point you to the knowledge base at the end of this session uh, where you can see an article about that. And unfortunately, these, these numbers, as I said, are sort of covenants assigned. Um, so they can't be forced to match EndNote or anything. The exception is, as I said, a, a ref ID, which I think is from RefWorks. So it, it doesn't change this number, but it shows up as a separate field. And if anybody wants that bulk PDF upload feature enabled on their account, if they could actually just email support, support at Covenants after the session and I can activate it for them. Okay, so we'll move on to extraction now. Now, I'm not going to go into excruciating detail on this just for time purposes, uh, but I'll give you an overview of how this works. So I'm going to go into quality assessment, which is the same as risk of bias. And what you're going to see is a side-by-side -side comparison of the PDF that I've uploaded with, in this case, a customized risk of bias form. Now I can edit or add to these domains as I want. So this is actually one I added, er added earlier, other sources of bias, but I can add a fifth one just so you can see how to do that. Add a description to maybe help your co-review authors see how that domain should be treated. And we do have outcome level risk of bias judgments. So to make a judgment, you can either click make judgment and then just select uh, high, low, and clear from here. Or what's really nice is that you can actually highlight directly from the PDF. So I'm just going to highlight random text just to show you how. Mm. Highlight that. A box will appear. From this drop down, you want to select the domain that you want that annotation to be associated with. Any commentary on the annotation itself. And then click Save. And that will be copied over to this judgment. I can then select my risk of bias, any additional comments, and save that judgment. So this screen is also helpful because it can give you a sort of snapshot of how far along in your judgments you are. You would see uh, high and low, you know, those boxes on the side there uh, to see which domains still need a judgment. Uh, we get a lot of questions about whether annotations can be applied to multiple domains, and the answer is sort of yes and no. I can't select this exact annotation for another domain, uh, but what I can do is highlight slightly around it just to get that text in there, and that counts as a new annotation. Now, I know that's a little bit clunky, uh, but better to know than not to know uh, how to do it, and the reason for it is really just we're somewhat held back by PDF text recognition technology. So this is a program embedded into Covenants rather than one that we've created ourselves. And when you first log into Quality Assessment, I know that this is a customized form, but when you first log in, you will be given the option of a customized form versus a Cochrane Risk of Bias template. You can add to and delete from the Cochrane template even after you've selected it, but it would come pre-populated with all of the standard domains. So that's quality assessment. We'll now go through data extraction. Uh, there's a question here if you can revert once a template has been chosen. Uh, no, you cannot, but even if 
you've chosen a template, you can still add to and delete from it and edit it as you want. So it's really just that initial choice. And then if you change your mind, you would have to manually edit the domains. Okay, so in data extraction, uh, you'll see this same sort of side-by-side -side sliding panel format that we saw in quality assessment. Unfortunately, in data extraction, another pretty common question we get is whether you can annotate your decisions the same way you can in quality assessment, and at the minute, no, you cannot. In this screen, the summary panel, you would see a summary of your identification and methods data that you've extracted so far, the characteristics that you're looking to extract and collect information on, your study arms or interventions, and the outcomes that have been programmed in. So in identification, this is essentially a nice little fill in the blank, very easy for people to go through. Under methods, we have a drop-down menu of methods that you can assign for an extraction. Now I know that that is a limited list and at the minute there isn't a customized study design form. Uh, this drop-down menu and, and selecting from it is really just for identification purposes. Uh, so it doesn't change the forms that you have later on. Now I know it's not ideal for non-randomized studies, for instance, uh, but confidence is more or less optimized for standard intervention reviews. So that's the reason for this list here. I believe we're going to be adding a customized study method option soon. Under population, you might include the inclusion and exclusion criteria for a particular study, pretreatment group differences, and the baseline characteristics table at the bottom here. So this is customizable. Each of these characteristics is something that I added this morning. Uh, you might, I'll just do new characteristic four rather than think of one, and that'll be added as a row. This can be collected by study arm or overall. Under interventions, you can have as many interventions as you want, really, uh, and you can select which comparison tables to export later on. You can also have descriptions of interventions here, and similarly to the baseline characteristics table, this is uh, customizable, so I'll add a new characteristic here. That'll be added as a row. And finally, your outcomes tables. So these might look a little intimidating because they're already all there, but we'll go through how to create one now. So I'll add an outcome. I'll just name it new outcome three. You have some options here. It can be continuous outcome, dichotomous outcome, or adverse event. I'll do dichotomous because uh, last time I did continuous. You have some various options here as far as how you'd like to collect that. We'll do percentage of events. If it's part of any subgroup that you want to indicate, whether it was fully, partially, or not reported. And really all of these are sort of optional uh, identifiers for that outcome. You can choose to add to it or leave it, leave it blank. I'll go back up here because there's a question about hazard ratios. Let's see, hazard ratios aren't on there, but what I would do in that case is uh, just use the odds ratio one and, and leave a note attached to that reference. Or you could collect the raw data as a number of events and uh, perform that meta-analysis outside of Covenants. So Covenants doesn't have any calculations in it. It's really just for collection of data. Okay, and there is one question there about the cluster RCT under methods. Uh, this 
shouldn't be mandatory. Uh, somebody was saying that when I've done data extraction, Covenance forces me to answer the question. Uh, you might need to contact support about that because it shouldn't, it shouldn't be doing that. Any of these can be left blank. No part of data extraction is required to be filled out. Okay, the last part of both quality assessment and data extraction that I'm going to go through is the pretty important consensus view. So it's important to note that when you're exporting either to RevMan or to Excel, which I'll show you how to do later on, it's only the consensus judgments that export. So I'll go into a completed consensus form here. And you can see all of my judgments. I'll go into the comparison screen. So what you would get here is a side-by-side -side comparison of judgments from reviewer one, as well as all of their annotations, judgments from reviewer two, and then the final judgment. Now this is a judgment that you actively have to make. The default is that it will be blank, even if both reviewers say uh, the same thing. You do need to go in and save that judgment and complete the consensus. If you want to copy over any of these quotations, you would simply click on them and then it's copied over and that applies to the information or commentary here as well. It gets copied over into the judgment comment here. Similar process for data extraction, although it might look a little bit more intimidating. So you would get a side-by-side -side comparison of reviewer one, reviewer two, and then it will indicate where decisions need to be made. So if I delete Canada from here, it now requires a decision. I would click on whichever reviewer I think is right, and that's now copied over. You would go through the whole form and do that for each collection box. Again, any of these can be left blank, it's not a problem. Let's see, we'll copy that over. And finally, with your outcomes, I'll draw your attention to the difference between, some of these have red boxes and some of them are grayed out. Now, the difference between those two is that the grayed out ones are ones where the reviewer has indicated that it's missing data. So it's an active uh, indication on the part of the reviewer that the paper did not report this, as opposed to the red boxes, which simply weren't filled out for whatever reason. So I can click on that and copy over that, yep, this data was missing. And you would go through that for each outcome that you've done. So let's see, I have a missing one here. One said five, one said 10. I'll just say that 10 is correct. Of course, these are all complete dummy numbers because they don't make any sense for blood pressure. You would go through the form and save it. And then this completed consensus on the side, these numbers is what will be exported. Okay, now that we've gone through the extraction process, I will answer that, <laughs> that question. Thank you very much for your patience, uh, Mario. Uh, so the question was, is it possible afterwards to extract XML or CSV, which will include tags, who reviewed papers and when, and similar metadata? Uh, so you can, and it's quite easy, uh, you can export your reference lists. However, that reference list will not include any information on the voting history. That can only be collected sort of reference by reference by collecting view history. And this brings up a sort of news feed of what's been completed on this reference. So it would say who started extraction, when they completed it, any documents that were added, and all of the voting history as well. If you're exporting your excluded studies list, it, the export will include the exclusion reason. It's the only exception to that. As well as any notes that have been added. So if I go in here, let's see, if I add a note to this, any notes here will be exported to CSV and to EndNote in the notes section. Uh, 
there's the question here about whether covenants can give the exact time of the activity done, not only a date. Uh, it doesn't do that, although it does give an order. So if, for instance, you have two reviewers extracting on the same day, you would see which one of them had gone first. Okay, any other questions on extraction before we go through export? Uh, there's a question here about essentially who can resolve consensus at the quality assessment stage. Now, as I was saying earlier, you can't indicate on a reference by reference basis who should or shouldn't be uh, completing the consensus. However, in the rules that we saw earlier under settings and then team settings, you can indicate a specific person who can complete consensus. So if that maybe has to be the PI or has to be a senior reviewer, you can indicate that here. But if that rule isn't set, anybody can complete consensus. Uh, there's another question here that if two people are screening but only one is extracting data, is their data automatically moved to consensus? Uh, unfortunately, no, it's not. Covenants assumes this pretty strict and standardized methodology that two people should be extracting. Uh, and in fact, the consensus form is only available to view once both people have indicated conclusion or sorry, completion. Now, that doesn't mean that the second reviewer actually has to fill anything out. They can leave everything blank if they want, but then the first reviewer does need to go through the consensus form and copy over all of their judgments, which should be fairly quick as they simply need to click on each cell. Now, there's a question here. Can two reviewers access the same screen remotely and do consensus reaching together live? Uh, absolutely, in theory, yes, they could. I would highly recommend that they have some sort of outside communication that they're doing, whether that's instant messaging or Skyping. Uh, Covenants at the Minute does not have any sort of instantaneous communication uh, capabilities. Essentially, the entire idea with covenants uh, would be that everybody's looking at the same reference list, the same extraction pages all at once, no matter where they're located. Yeah, so that's one of the, the big advantages of it, I think. No more of the emailing five versions of the same Excel sheet and then realizing that you spent an hour working on the wrong one. Uh, hopefully, no more of that. The other limitation on doing consensus reaching live on a tele teleconference would, of course, simply be the refresh rate of your internet connection. Okay, any more questions about extraction? Which includes both data extraction and quality assessment. Okay, we'll go through the export studies tool finally, and uh, then after that we'll open it up to just generic questions and answers, and I'll point you guys to some support options. So as before, we'll do these right to left. We do have a Prisma, sort of automatically formatted Prisma diagram that you can do a screenshot of. That includes exclusion reasons here. So those are all automatically counted for you. you can export directly to RevMan. Now this RevMan file does have to be kept locally on your computer. At the minute there's no uh, automated interaction between Archie and Covenants, so that does need to go to your computer before it's uploaded to, uh, to Covenants. 
Now, the way that this works is you would upload that file. Covenants will populate it with whatever extraction you've done and then give you a new version of the file to download. So it doesn't overwrite your original file. Think of this as if you email a version of a Word document to someone and they make edits and send it back to you, you do still have that original version. You just now have an updated version. So this would be an updated version of your RevMan file. Another important thing to know is that Covenants uh, does not support review updates at the minute. So if you have a RevMan file which already has extracted data in it, Covenants is unable to overwrite that. You can have you know, your protocol and your discussion all in your RevMan file. It's just the data section of that file does need to be blank. If you're doing a review update, what I would recommend is to export into a new sort of unrelated RevMan file and then just to manually merge those two by copying over. And finally, your references and data. So that includes if you want to export your data rather than to RevMan, if you want to go into Excel, you would do that by selecting Included and checking this box here, Export Extracted Data. That will give you a nice file for download. You can also export information on each of your reference lists, so the ones that are currently in screening full text review or the ones you know that you've made decisions on that are already in irrelevant. You have a bit of a variety here of reference managers and essentially Covenants gives you a RAS file uh, which most reference managers should be able to take as well as a CSV or Excel file. You can click export and that'll give you another file for download. Uh, there is a question here, can the comparison table arms be inverted instead of control versus intervention the other way around? So essentially this is reflective of the order in which I program those arms into my data extraction form. So if I added my intervention first, it would be showing up first. Do you know, I've never actually renamed it though. I always leave the default name, but there you, you could switch the name, uh, but the table itself would still go out as control versus intervention if control were added first. And of course, if I had a multi-arm review or rather multi-arm studies, I would have a long list here of the different combinations of each and which comparison tables I'd like to export. All right, that's the export tool. Perhaps while everybody's thinking of some questions, I'll show you where to access our support uh, so if you click this question mark in the corner here, you'll have the option to send us an email. Of course, that's basically me. On the other end, I do run our support email, uh, unless you choose to email us in Spanish, in which case I'll pass you on to the Spanish language team, or visit the knowledge base. The knowledge base is where we keep all of our frequently asked questions. <coughs> Excuse me. There is a sort of special section here for Cochrane authors, links to previous webinars. There will be a link to this webinar put up there in the future. And most of these articles include some screenshots. They are a good place to go uh, if you're initially having some trouble. Uh, let's see, I'll take these in reverse. There's a question here. Can we use covenants also for data collection from trial registries? Um, I'm not, unfortunately, not familiar with exactly how you would extract from trial registries, but essentially as long as you have a reference for that trial registry <coughs> in your covenants reference list, uh, there will be an extraction form for it, and then you're just limited by the, the certain parts of the covenants extraction form that are customizable versus the ones that aren't. As I was saying, it is optimized for fairly standard intervention reviews. The entire idea with covenants is that anybody could pick it up and know what they were doing and be able to just be guided through the review process. If you have a very complex review or need a lot of customized features, you might be better off with a, a program like Epi Reviewer that has a little bit more capability, but perhaps isn't so 
easy to learn. And there's another question here. Will it be possible to list which fields to export into Excel? Or is this automatically done? Uh, yep, so essentially when you export into Excel, all of the fields, it, it's standard what exports. Of course, you can delete that if you so choose. So here, I'll download this file and open it up so that you can see what an Excel extraction from Covenants would look like. Let's see, so you have title authors, abstract, year, month, journal, volume, issue, page, you know, essentially your, your standard reference things, and then the notes here on the side I find very helpful. So you can see who added a note and when, and actually in this case it has an exact time in addition to a date. Okay, and then your included study data. This will only have one in this because I only have one in which the complete consensus is done. So you get a list of all of your included studies here, and then each review, or sorry, each study gets its own page that is laid out quite similarly to how it is in Covenants, and all of your information would be here. Uh, when you use the find a study function, what does the UI look like and what stage does it present? So the find a study function actually searches all of your study lists, so whether it's in the irrelevant list or if it's in the included list, doesn't matter. So I'll just put in Conchistre because that's the one we were just looking at. Click enter and it'll bring me sort of a link to that, and when I click on that, it'll bring me to the page where that study is, which is, in this case, the completed uh, data extraction page. Another question for reviews already going on, can only extraction tool be used without the screening part? So you could, yeah, if you wanted to skip screening, the key there would be that when you import your studies, as we saw at the beginning, you would want to put them directly into included so that you aren't forced to vote on them, so that they'll just go directly into your extraction list. <coughs> Another question, when you export to RevMan, do you have to specify the studies included in RevMan before actually exporting from Covenants, or does Covenants do that for you? Yep, so all of your included studies will be exported to RevMan, as well as actually all of your full text exclusions go to RevMan as well with their exclusion reason. As far as the data, uh, it's, it's automatic which ones go, and it will be all of the ones that have had their consensus form completed. Any more questions? Uh, yes, there is an import from, mm, I know it's confusing you. This is uh, sort of a hangover from a previous feature that we had, which really it turned out just didn't play well with PubMed. So you used to be able to put your search criteria in here and have it uh, import directly that way. It just didn't work very well, so what we did instead was to enable PubMed XMLs to be imported instead. So your abstracts, if they're included in your reference list, whether that's exported directly from a database or from a reference manager such as EndNote or Mendeley, uh, as long as they're included in that file, which you're usually given an option whether or not you can include that, uh, yes, they will be imported. So if I go to my screening list, I had collapsed them all just for the sake of being able to see more, but you can see that there is an abstract here. But then I can hide that for the purpose of seeing more at, at one time. 
and those are automatically imported with my reference list. Any more questions? question here, can you use tags to, say, keep track of the protocols for studies? Uh, you could use it that way. The only caveat I'll, I'll put with that is that you can't filter by tag once a reference is in an inactive list. So if you end up excluding something uh, that's a protocol but you need to come back to it later, you might be better off using a note rather than a tag. But you could definitely use it to tag all of your study protocols just to indicate that it is in fact a protocol. That would be a very good use of the tool actually. And there's a question here about whether you can download a copy of, I hope she's referring to a PDF here, uh, for printing if somebody else has uploaded it. And yes, that's correct. So I'll go to the full text page here. Any PDFs that I have uploaded from this account, say Annalise Arno, uh, will be available to any reviewer who has access to this review. So Damian is one of the other reviewers on this review. Uh, he has access to that file the same as every, I do, as everybody else does. Okay, we just have a couple minutes left. Any other questions? Uh, there's a question here about costs. So at the minute, Covenants is entirely free. The plan is that registered Cochrane reviews will always be free. As far as the details of when a payment plan will come into place, they're still working that out. So unfortunately, I just don't have more detail than that. But any changes to the pricing plan will uh, have ample notice to our users before they're implemented. And Sonia, yes, I actually, um, there's one more question here that incidentally was also a support request. I'm, I'm working on getting a reference for it. So the question was in the Covenants intro YouTube video, you are saying that Covenants expedites the process of productions of systematic reviews by 30%. Uh, and she's asking for a reference on that. That video was made unfortunately before I came on the team. I'm, I'm sure they do have a reference for it. Uh, and I'm working on essentially finding that and sending it along to you. So. And the recording of this webinar, as well as essentially all webinars that the Covenants team gives, are linked. I'm going to go back to the knowledge base here. They would be linked from this for Cochrane Authors and Webinars page. So you can see a bunch of links here of our previous ones. And as soon as I have a link for this webinar, uh, it will be added to this list. You'll also notice here there's a next webinar uh, notification that I'll just share with everybody that we do have two webinar series that we're running sort of in tandem. The first is called Covenants Forum, and it's meant to be much quicker, much more informal than these uh, workshops, where at the beginning I will share sort of a tip of the week, a creative use of a particular tool, or a part of the tool that I think maybe more people need to be aware of that isn't being used. Uh, and that will be followed by a conversation, really, between reviewers themselves, between reviewers and the Covenants team, and just sort of an ongoing conversation with our, our user base. So that's the first series. The second one will be an introduction to Covenants uh, workshop series, which will be sessions quite similar to this one. So if you need a refresher course or if somebody else from your team uh, wants to learn a bit about Covenants, they can attend one of those webinars as well. And the information for those webinars is available on the Cochrane Training website. Uh, 
Uh, Dario, would you like to close it out? Yes. Well, thanks. Thanks, Annalie, for this great presentation. Just let me shift to my screen and our last slide. So thank you all for uh, participating in this in this webinar. And uh, uh, I just want to say that we will be sending out the uh, email with a link to evaluation form. We appreciate your feedback very much. Um, and uh, if you have any further questions, please send us uh, either by Twitter, uh, we have this at Cochrane Train, hashtag Cochrane Learning Live, where you can tweet us uh, your question or just send us an email to training at Cochrane.org. And uh, we'll have Annalise answering your questions during the next week or so. And finally, we invite you to join us for the next webinar in the Cochrane Learning Live series. Uh, on April 12th, we'll have Richard Morley, Cochrane Consumer Network Coordinator, talking on new ways of involving consumers in the work of Cochrane. Um, and you can, on this we website, you can check the full webinar program and you can start signing up, signing up if you like. So thank you again and hope to see you next time.